Hello, I'm pleased to be with you again now for a live Q&A session with two of our shipping speakers. Craig, Craig Jazienski, President and Chief Executive of Wallenius Wilhelmsen, and Jeremy Nixon, Chief Executive of Ocean Network Express. We've covered a wide range of topics in our shipping sessions, and now's your chance to put your questions to these shipping leaders. Thank you for your questions you've already sent in, and please type additional questions into the chat box. And let's start with one of the questions we've already received. This is a quite a broad question about emissions and how emissions from shipping can be tackled and indeed perhaps reduced over the long term, certainly in intensity, if not in volume. What, what are the ways the shipping industry has to go about that? Craig, can I come to you first, please? Yeah, absolutely, Simon, thank you. I think you said the word intensity. Uh, and the reason why I draw focus to that is on the basis that we expect world trade to continue to grow, uh, and given the importance of ocean transportation to facilitate world trade, uh, one can only expect that there's going to be an increased activity on the oceans over time. Uh, so from a carbon, a total carbon effect point of view, if we take the next decade, for example, where I think we all recognize we, we've yet to find the perfect silver bullet to solve the carbon challenge we have in the industry. Uh, so if we look at the next decade, one can assume that potentially there will be a growth in total carbon emissions from shipping. Again, it's not a point to be proud of, So, but I think it's back to the intensity. So what are we doing as an industry to reduce the intensity per unit mile or ton mile or unit kilometer, whatever measure that we wish to use, but intensity is the key. So I think um, certainly from our perspective, and actually I think I think Jeremy and, and Juan have a very similar view on this in, in terms of everything that we can do to improve the, or at least reduce the intensity per um, ton kilometer is the focus that we can get through efficiency of the vessels and the, and the voyages themselves, increasing utilization factors, uh, reducing time at sea, uh, becoming more efficient and effective in the way that we're entering and departing ports so we minimize waiting time. There's some of the immediate operational actions that we've all been taking for for many, many years. That's helping us to reduce that intensity. And, and, and just for our perspective, we've reduced our intensity by 33% since 2008. So there's a lot that we've already done as an industry, not just Wallonius Williamson, I think the whole industry is there. There's a lot that's already been done. What we need to do going forward is to continue to look for those types of operating efficiencies. But now the next, I think the next real big phase is about finding those, the fuel sources or the sources of energy that can start to take either a carbon completely out of the equation or at least start to reduce the amount of carbon that's emitted from shipping. Because again, on the basis that shipping will expand over time, uh, that, that size of the problem we have will only, will only grow unless we focus on intensity. Jeremy, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I think Craig's covered it very well. And uh, I don't really have a lot to add. Um, you know, clearly we, we've gone through this, uh, you know, clearly it's about dealing with existing technology and fuel type, which is oil today, and trying to minimize the amount of usage of that particular product and go through this, this, this uh, efficiency drive, which Craig talks about. And, and the way we're doing that today is with the new ships, we, we build bigger and new, and those are by design more efficient. And we're trying to retrofit on existing ships. But in the same way that the industry went from sail power you know, in the 18th century to coal power in the 19th century through to oil power in the 20th century, you know, for, for the next century, uh, well, be well before that, um, you know, for after about 2030, 2035, we have to find a new fuel type, uh, which is carbon free. And uh, that's really our big challenge. So I think, you know, for Craig and myself and a lot of the senior uh, executive teams on, on, on with shipping companies is that we are very, very focused on getting our carbon intensity down over the next 10 years by building bigger, better efficient ships and retrofitting, 
the challenge really comes in how do we then go to the next stage uh, in the investment cycle uh, to, to actually invest in you know complete decarb solutions that leads on a little bit to the next in que question which is how can ship owners or operators be incentivized to retrofit or build new ships using the latest technology i mean i think that this question sort of presupposes we know what that technology is so perhaps if you could give us a, a sort of a sense of the, the the leading candidates and then give us some idea about what you think needs to be done to incentivize that is it would there just be purely commercial incentives or do there need to be other incentives yeah uh, maybe i kick off this one and sure. great great follows up as yeah. needed i i think that um you know the I, I, first of all, I think that there is a there is a real uh, willingness among shipping companies and the shipping industry to decarbonize. Secondly, uh, we have this unique situation where we actually have a single UN body, which is the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, which oversees all shipping globally. And we've taken the Paris Agreement 215 goals and converted those across into uh, new IMO goals, which are very, very specific about hitting certain carbon intensity targets by 2030 and 2050. So I think we're off to a very good start in terms of the willingness of the industry and, and having a central body which is setting the targets. And by, by June, July, we'll actually put more flesh on the bones about how that's to be done and measured. Um, the, the, the further challenge, though, is is around the technology. And and uh, just to your point, Simon, uh, the technology is conceptually known, but is not proven yet at, at the scalable size of, of the ship sizes that Craig and myself and other shipping companies are operating today. So, the, you know, the candidates are hydrogen, uh, ammonia, e-methanol, um, potentially uh, some kind of uh, fuel cell, uh, even nuclear. They, they, these are the kind of the ones that are being suggested, right? But all of those have significant challenges in around how you scale those up. And secondly, that you deploy them in a safe manner as well. Um, and, and, and thirdly, there's enough fuel made available to the industry um, to, to actually to support that. So that is a very intensive dialogue and discussion that we are now having at the registry stage, but also across our industry to industry uh, trade associations and bodies to see what further we can developments we can do in that direction. But it's still quite early days. Maybe in the short sea sector, we have some successes with some hydrogen applications and we have some um, uh, ammonia concepts now being looked at. But LNG is, is also being mentioned. And of course, LNG is not a decarbonized fuel. Um, it helps to, to reduce to a certain extent the carbon footprint. But it's, so, so we know LNG is not really the long-term solution. I think, Simon, um, just to, to build on to yeah. what Jeremy was talking about as far as um, um, incentivizing and the question very much around how do we incentivize ship owners to, to make these leaps, I, I think I take almost uh, another way into it how 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 do we how we not how do we create uh, non incentives um or how do we ensure that those that are early movers and and fast movers that do invest a lot of money in trying to uh to make the changes that we make uh, that we're not punished uh and i think that's that's one of the challenges that we see currently across the industry is is bringing forward some type of equitable market based measure and we don't have the perfect recipe we're not a regulator but uh to find a market-based measure which actually incentivizes those that that do invest, that do put their money into technology, uh, and that those that, that choose not to do anything, uh, because that's an option as well, um, that there um, there's no disincentive, uh, that they uh, they can simply get away with doing nothing. Uh, we think that's not really the solution, and we've we've talked a lot across the industry and. It's often talked about the notion of just reducing speed uh, as one of the uh, the methods. Um, we consider that principally, if you take that across all sectors, reducing speed based on the fuels that we utilize today. Yes, it has a positive effect, uh, effects without question, but it completely penalizes those operators, owner operators that have invested huge amounts of money 
in increasing scale and efficiency of vessels like like we have done and like uh, Jeremy's organization have done. So I, I'm a little bit less about incentives per se, but it's more about making sure that we're not punished. There's a couple of questions which sort of drill down in a little bit into the, some of these technologies. One of them is about LNG and methane leaks. Um, one of our, our uh, questions is about cruise ships moving, moving to LNG and if there are offsetting technologies to prevent methane emissions. Another one is about sail power and whether sail power has a future to augment um, uh, powering uh, commercial vessels. Um, because, I mean, sail power is one of those things that crops up every few years in my patch, along with the resurgence of airships. And it's one of, the, one of those things that never seems to quite happen. So any thoughts on methane leaks or sail power? I'd Jeremy, love to jump on the wind go. power. Oh, yeah, go, yeah, go on then, Craig, to, to tell us about wind power. So we, um, we, we have a strong belief in, in wind power going forward. Uh, we've just launched uh, All Cell Wind as a concept, uh, but a very serious concept where we expect to have uh, a yard ready design by the middle of this year, in fact. So uh, we, we think it's very real. This is a, for, for me, this is a very good example of, of an area where we're willing to invest heavily to try something very different and very new. In fact, it's not very different and new because we started with, with sail mm -hmm. originally, as, as Jeremy pointed out. But it's kind of going back to the future in many ways where we can harness a natural source of energy to drive these uh, these vessels through water. Uh, do we believe fundamentally that we can replace, we operate roughly 120 vessels at any given time, do we believe that fundamentally we can replace our entire fleet with wind powered? No, we don't. Uh, do we think that we can have one to two to five to ten? Uh, yeah, I would certainly hope so because it's, it's, it's not well, it's a step in the right direction. It's a massive step in the right direction because we're looking at a 90% a saving on carbon emissions based on what are available of fuels today. So will wind be the answer in 30 years' time? I, I think it's way too early to make that prediction. But we firmly believe at Wallonius Willemson it is a step on that journey. It's a bit like LNG is a step in the right direction, but it's only a maybe it's a 20% improvement on carbon emissions, it's still a carbon fuel. You don't get the same impact as we can get in the next decade or two um, from wind. Uh, and as Jeremy said, when we come back to the other types of fuels, just to cover those quickly uh, as well, um, there are multiple sources of fuels that we think could be available in the future, but the key here is, is quantity, just the sheer amount of power that's required on each individual vessel every single day is enormous. Just, and I mentioned this in the panel earlier, but just one of our, one of our vessels uh, requires the equivalent of 40,000 households in the course of 24 hours. I don't think Jeremy's vessels are much different, probably slightly greater. Uh, it's a huge amount of energy, and therefore a huge amount of fuel that we need. So therefore we, we're looking at wind as, a, um, as certainly one of the paths into the future. Just to move to a slightly different area of um, the environmental impact of shipping, someone has asked, does anyone have a measure of how air pollution in high traffic ports has decreased and what sort of improvements can be made to uh, keep that, keep that um, reduction going? Because it's, we, it's not just carbon yeah. uh, we need to worry about, is it? Yeah. Yeah, so, so I think, uh, you know, a few points on that. Um, you know, as an ex seafarer myself, um, you know, I used to be on the bridge wing and look up at the smokestack, you know, and it wasn't always so nice what you saw coming up out of that smokestack. And that was in the middle of the deep sea ocean. Um, and you sort of, you know, as you got nearer to land, you realize that actually it, it is actually a lot of fumes being given off. And so very pleased to see that in 2020, uh, again, through the IMO, uh, we reached an agreement across the whole industry, uh, every type of ship type, deep sea, big, small, whatever, to, to go to this low sulfur fuel. So we were burning originally 5% sulfur fuel, um, and then we went to 3.5%, and now you know, we're down to, down to 0.5 sulfur fuel uh, SOX component. 
And actually, on many of the coastlines now, we dropped down to 0.1%. So that actually, in terms of air quality, we've taken a big step forward in 220 at the global level to reduce our nitrogen oxide and reduce our sulfide oxides in, 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 our, in our burning. And that's been an industry initiative. And that has been expensive. I mean, that has, you know, we talk about costs, you know, that has probably added about today about, uh, there's a spread of about $125 a tonne um, between low sulfur and high sulfur. Um, so that, just to give you an idea, that, that increases just my company's fuel bill by a billion dollars by doing that. Um, but we've done it, and and I think that's that 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 that's a big breakthrough. Um, and if we can get to these other technologies which don't burn these type of types, then that'll be great. The other area I think of of good progress now is we're starting to make, and some of uh, what so, what somebody's just asked that on the panel is about uh, the use of uh, when vessels are in port, no longer having their diesel generators on but actually plugging in to the, the electricity grid in the port. And we, we do that now in California. Um, so all of our ships now plug in. As soon as they come alongside, we shut down the diesels, we plug into the mains. And that, again, stops all the stuff going up the smokestack. And um, I, I could see that accelerating, and we do that in more locations around the world. And I know the EU is now looking at that, that very seriously at the moment about whether to adopt the same process of cold ironing, as we call it, where we, we literally connect up. Um, and then there's other systems coming in now where there's also have this sort of scrubber technology, which tries to clean the fuel, the, the, the fumes coming up out of the stack uh, as well. Um, so there's varying at various, various initiatives going on. Here's an interesting question that's slightly on the same uh, tack, but um, looking at it from a slightly different angle. Uh, regardless of alternative fuels, someone asks, is the size of vessels going to be impacted by goals for greenhouse gas reductions? Or are there other reasons, presumably, that uh, the size of vessels will be changing, changing global trading patterns, for example? Well, we, we think there has already. and. Um... When, when I looked at and referred to the improvement we've had in carbon intensity since, since 2008, uh, a lot of that has actually been driven through scale. So just simply increasing or simply, not simple at all, but increasing the average size of the fleet in terms of the size of the vessels. Uh, we're able to move more products uh, um, per uh, tonne of carbon emitted. So that's been one of the key drivers for uh, for reducing intensity for all of us, particularly those of, those of us operating in in the line of shipping, such as Jeremy and, and, and our organisation. So I think it's already definitely had an effect. Uh, going forward, it continue can continue to have an effect, but we will, in the different segments of shipping, we're going to reach a point where you you cannot scale up any any more. It just becomes a negative efficiency. So. Uh, Probably not right to sit on this this Q and A to to speculate on where that may or may not be, but um, that's a fact that we have to bear in mind. There is a point we'll get as big as we can get. Then we're back to the source of energy, and how do we find clean energy, alternative sources of energy and fuels to 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 power these vessels through water? Yeah, Jeremy, just to add to Ray's point, you know, I think uh, with the you know, the, the, one of the things that we can't get away from is oil-based fuel is very highly calorific. So you get a real bang for your buck in terms of it, it, its weight in relation to the overall size of the ship and the cargo intake. So it's very calorific and it, and it gives a very good boost. And so that has allowed us to build these bigger and bigger ships to get these slot economics, uh, which Craig's referring to. But when we start going to other fuel types, which are less calorific, um, then that means that if you if the ships are big, you have to have a lot more fuel on board than you were carrying before, because it's not so calorific as it was previously. So, and at the same time, the bigger and the bigger the ships get, then for people running liner services like like Craig and myself, the frequency becomes um, you offer less frequency if you're not careful. So, we may see, possibly in 15 to 20 years time, a movement back to watership sites because we can put a hybrid battery into that. We could run, start to run electric solutions on that because the physical size of the ship is smaller 
and therefore, you know, putting the engine engine management system and the fuel type on board is easier than having a really, really massive ship and then struggling to try and push that through the water for 30 days on a, on a long-term voyage. But but let's wait and see. Um, you know, there's so much uh, technological enhancements and, and R&D that we have to do as an industry. And one of the things we are trying to do is say, look, you know, we can't invent this stuff ourselves as the shipping industry. We have got to work on a cross collaboration across many industries. We've got to get the best guys in the aerospace industries, other, other energy companies, and, and look at all of these different advancements in terms of technology about how to design a ship type for the future that's really fit for purpose and can handle these new fuel types and can still look after the customer's needs, which is to move stuff from A to B as safely as possible. We have another question, which is a little bit about incentives, but a, a, a broader question, an interesting question, which is, do you see um, a, a carbon tax as providing the right kind of incentives? Or do you, I think the question is asking, do you fear regulation if you don't make the right moves towards decarbonizing shipping? I mean, would car, would a carbon tax be, be, be valuable in incentivizing everybody to move in the right direction? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the um, the first point actually is that um, as an industry, we've actually already come up with a proposal to self tax ourselves um, to create a carbon levy or, or or a fuel cost levy. So we would um, we would for every ton of fuel that we burn, we're saying let's put two or three dollars US dollars aside. Um, and use that as a, a kind of levy on ourselves and then pool all that money and working with the IMO, set up a research and technology fund, which we can then use this, you know, we're estimating somewhere where three to $5 billion is what that would raise within a couple of years and, and use that to further fast accelerate this, uh, technological drive to find new fuel types, new new engine types, new designs of ships. Um, and, and we're volunteering to do that. We want to do that. And, and so I think that's that's a very positive step. And, and OK, maybe, you know, later on, it has to be a bit higher than that and whatever. Right. But what we are against is just being taxed for the sake of being taxed. And and then that money being taken from us and then we never see it come back to, in, into the shipping industry to help with the technological developments because we are going to have to spend billions and billions of dollars over the next 5, 10, 15 years developing new technologies and deploying new ship systems uh, to, to decarbonize. So, um, you know, if I could just give you an example, um, you know, probably today you could say on average it's probably about $600 a ton is $550, $600 a ton is what it costs uh, with existing fuel types. Um, some people are suggesting, you know, a, 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 a tax on the industry of five or $600 a ton. So that would double the price of fuel. Um, there's no way that we could absorb that as, as individual companies. Um, we could potentially pass that on down the supply chain um, in a long period of time, but that would be a big economic shock as well to our to all our customers and ultimately all of us as consumers as well. And at the end of the day, would we really get the value out of it? So I, I really like this idea about having this uh, bunker levy and um, a number of national governments are now behind us and supporting this. And uh, I hope very much through the UN and IMO this year, we can make a breakthrough and, and get that adopted uh, as, as a universal way of improving the research and development and keeping that money within the industry. Sorry, a bit long-winded, but uh, one of my pet topics. Mm, not but at I all. Think, well, a, but I, I, yes, sorry, Joe, Simon, just quickly too. I think, I think no, it's no. The, the better ways forward. And from an affordability point of view, if you just look at the impact that we had with adopting 0.5% content sulfur fuel, that overnight impact that that's had on the shipping industry and the cost that's been absorbed in the supply chain has gone let's say at the end of the day relatively unnoticed to the end consumer we're talking about a, a portion or, or a fractional amount of that money 
that we already spent at the turn of the previous year uh, in providing a fund to actually do some good for the industry. So we also fully support that idea rather than just tax for the sake of it. Uh, let's put that money to good use and use it in the industry to collaborate and drive the changes that we know that we need. We're coming close to the end of our session here, but we've got one last question. It's a big, broad question, but I think it's an interesting one because it looks at other ways of um, reducing uh, the environmental um, damage that shipping could do. And that's about digitalization. And I presume what the question here is, it's asking about digitalization in shipping. One thing you do is, is make shipping more efficient. It's one of those industries that has sort of lagged behind, perhaps, in the, in, in, in the move to digitalization. How much is that um, going to impact shipping in, in, in the near future? We think it's so, key. I think it already has, and it already is going on. Um, you know, we, we, we are, the shipping industry has rapidly digitalizing many, many, um, many ways that it's working, um, the way it interfaces with its customers, but also the way that um, we operate and manage our, our assets and uh, our machinery, and we monitor uh, real time performance of the ships and the fuel efficiency of the ships. Um, and the way that we, you know, weather forecasting systems, we use uh, big data, AI analytics to look at uh, how to uh, minimize delay on the voyage, uh, how to skirt around certain weather systems so that we don't waste a lot of fuel in terms of trying to catch up. Um, the way, you know, we're trying to forecast demand. So it's, I, think it's, I think a lot of that's going on. And it's, a, it's if I get the analogy, it's a bit like going back 20 years ago. You know, I think all of us could probably lift up the bonnet of our cars and we could look inside and we had some idea about how the engine worked and maybe there's a few things we could tweak if it wasn't working these days uh, honestly you go on board the modern container ships now or the modern ships that we have in the fleets uh, and the engine management systems and digital technology systems and the monitoring systems are, are really very advanced and that data you know to the second is being transferred up by satellite signals back to central control systems where we're monitoring and measuring all the time the uh, the efficiency of the engines and looking, we're moving away from planned maintenance on a, on a fixed day basis or fixed weekly basis, looking at, oh, that particular bearing or whatever is starting to wear out. So actually we need to address that now rather than waiting for the next service. And other stuff we can say, well, actually, you know, that's, that's performing well. It doesn't need to be uh, maintained for a period longer. So I think there's a lot of applications going on at the moment. Still more we can do, of course. Hmm. Okay. Craig, one last word about digitalization. Yeah, no, look, I fully support. I think the um, from shipping point of view, we're one of the, the last asset classes to really adopt digitalization across the, the, the multiple systems we have on board ships. Uh, and also in the offices and the way we work with our clients. So I think the industry is playing catch up very quickly. Uh, I think we're uh, we're moving up to catching up to time and uh, and I think it's critical for us going forward. That's great, thanks. Um, we have uh, one quick word on noise pollution. We've had a question about that. Is that an issue for shipping and can anything be done to tackle it we've, uh, we've got very little time so we can have one quick answer from one of you i think on that one jeremy yeah i mean no, no noise pollution um is something that is important and uh you know if we can if we can particularly in ports if we can get this uh cold ironing as we call it if we can plug into the uh into the main systems which we're very keen to do um, as I say, we're already doing it in, in certain countries in the world that we can shut off those diesel generators and that, that, that'll be a lot quieter. And maybe I could just quickly jump in and say on the Wales front, uh, yeah. you know, we all do take that very seriously. And yes, uh, yes um, you know, looking at the environment is not just about, you know, carbon intensity. It is also about the wildlife and it is also about protecting various species. And um, yeah, very pleased to say that, uh, you know, we, we work very closely, all of us, with the US Coast Guard to try and uh, protect marine life as well. Great. And we, well, from a, from no, a no, noise no, pollution no. point of view, oh, sorry, Simon. I think we've actually running out of time now. I was just going to say it's a very upbeat note to finish on.
Um, and uh, as I say, we're running out of time. This closes the World Ocean Summit shipping track. We'd like to thank you for your engagement and interaction with the speakers of this session. Please switch to the session streaming in the plenary track now for the rest of the day. Thank you and goodbye.